Since I first learned how, I have loved to talk. Marilyn and Denise, my two older sisters, used to set the kitchen timer for five minutes, challenging me to go that long without saying a word. I never once made it the whole five minutes. Talking in the kitchen to your siblings, however, is very different from talking in this concert hall to a large and diverse audience. Accordingly, I am both excited and humbled by this opportunity to speak to you. But I want this experience to be much more than just my talking to you. I want this experience to be one where the Spirit teaches and edifies, and I appreciate the music and the prayer that have helped set the tone for this to take place. In addition to loving to talk, and in part because I love to talk, I love being a lawyer. As a junior in high school, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer for two reasons. First, I wanted to be different by going into a challenging profession where not many women were employed. This was the mid-70s when less than 20 percent of the attorneys in America were women. Second, I wanted to be rich. <laughs> I didn't have any clearly formed ideas of what I would do with the money I made, but in my small hometown of Brownfield, Texas, having a swimming pool in your backyard was a pretty big deal. And I think that was my primary aspiration at the time. <laughs> As I found out more about being a lawyer, I learned of two outstanding attorneys, Rex Lee and Dallin Oaks. They were faithful members of the Church, and they had achieved very visible levels of professional excellence. They became my ideals. My choice of a major as a freshman at BYU was simplified when I discovered they had both been accounting majors, so accounting was my choice as well. I was in heaven when I discovered that two of then-President Dallin Oaks' sons were not only in my BYU ward, but they were assigned to my family home evening group. I had visions of dazzling them and finding myself a member of Dallin Oaks' inner circle. <laughs> However, my Texas twang dashed these hopes. I accepted that I had failed to dazzle and I'm still waiting for an entree to Elder Oak's inner circle. <laughs> Nevertheless, I held on to my desire to emulate him by studying the law, and I absorbed the content, organization, and cadence of his talks. I was likewise thrilled my freshman year to be invited to a lunch hosted by none other than Rex Lee, who was then dean of the still-new J. Reuben Clark Law School. It was a privilege to meet him, and I still remember his infectious smile and how he made me feel important. He encouraged me to study law and helped me begin to see the powerful advantages a legal education had to offer, advantages that went beyond proving myself in a challenging profession and getting rich. One of these advantages became very compelling during my junior year of college. A well-known talk show host taped a show in Utah. He picked a controversial topic, one many people of faith would feel strongly about on moral grounds. When asked questions about why they objected to the position he took, however, many members of the audience were not able to clearly articulate their objections, even though very valid objections existed. As a result, I became even more committed to studying law, so I would be able to articulately and persuasively defend my positions on controversial topics. Following graduation from BYU, despite an accounting job offer that could have satisfied my original two goals, I began my studies at J. Reuben Clark Law School. For me, law school was a fun, exciting, meaningful experience from start to finish. I learned to think in new ways, and I met people who remain beloved friends to this day. I also discovered and refined my true passion, advocacy. For me, it was not enough to defend a position and be thought reasonable. My highs came when I persuaded someone to think about an issue or another person in a way they had not thought about before. It is on being an advocate I want to focus today. I want to encourage your advocacy in public settings, advocacy that is directed toward authority figures, legal systems, and institutions. But I also want to encourage your advocacy in less visible ways. This is a picture of my two older sisters, Marilyn and Denise, yes, the ones that would later set the kitchen timer, and me. If you look closely at the picture, you will notice that my collar is pulled up a little bit. 
This is because I was still a little wobbly when it came to sitting up by myself. So my sisters were holding on to the back of my dress to keep me from falling. I have been the beneficiary of behind-the-scenes advocacy my entire life, and it has been provided by family, friends, and professional associates in ways too numerous to mention. Today it is evidenced by the fact that my husband, my 81-year-old mother, five of my six siblings, the missing sibling is with the U.S. State Department in Egypt and wishes he could be here, Brothers and sisters-in-law, children and nieces and nephews have traveled approximately 15,000 miles in to support me in person today. If you take nothing else away from my remarks, please think about those who advocate for your success in less visible ways and express your gratitude to them. Now, in what I hope is true Dallin Oaks fashion, I want to discuss three points about being an advocate. First, recognize we are all called to be advocates. Second, determine some key elements of what being an effective advocate means. And third, contemplate for who and what we should advocate. I will then share some examples to illustrate these points. We are advocates because Jesus Christ, our perfect exemplar, is an advocate. In this dispensation, he described himself on at least five occasions as an advocate, and prophets in other dispensations have also testified of this key role he plays. He has given us the instruction, for that which ye have seen me do, even that shall ye do. So as we are striving to emulate our Savior, to do what he does, we should be advocates. He has placed people in your life who you are called to love, and circumstances that you are called to support or change, both will require your advocacy. While a law degree is not required to be an advocate, although it certainly does help develop that ability, I believe the major drop in the number of students enrolling in law school is evidence that our society places less value on advocacy than it has in the past. As I read articles, follow social media threads, and engage in conversations, I find those who disparage seem to far outnumber those who advocate. We need to change this imbalance by playing the role of advocate more and the role of critic less. Remember, Christ is our example, so civility must be paramount. There is no room for mocking, labeling, bullying, or belittling. Being an advocate takes more skill and work than being a critic. I have spent decades observing other advocates and trying to refine my own abilities as an advocate. Based on this, I would like to share a few key aspects of effective advocacy that I have come to value and that may help you increase the effectiveness of your own advocacy. These principles apply both in and out of the courtroom, and while they are often used in adversarial situations, they also apply when no direct conflict exists. Effective advocates present their case to the party who has authority to grant the relief sought. In lay terms, this means you should focus on persuading people who actually have the power to do what you ask. The Savior exemplifies this by being our advocate with the Father. The Savior's pleading on our behalf is directed toward the ultimate decision maker. In the book, Making Your Case, by Antonin Scalia, a recently deceased justice on the United States Supreme Court, and Brian Garner, the authors observe, nothing is accomplished by trying to persuade someone who lacks the authority to do what you're asking, whether it's a hotel clerk with no discretion to adjust your bill, or a receptionist who cannot bind the company to the contract you propose. Persuasion directed to an inappropriate audience is ineffective. Too often, I see energy expended on actions that are at best preaching to the choir and at worst throwing gasoline on a fire. Facebook posts read by an audience with no more power than the writer does to affect change are not effective advocacy. While rallying others to your cause is sometimes an important part of advocacy, do not be distracted by thinking this is your end goal. Whether working to help an individual do something she could not do for herself, promoting a cause, or changing an existing policy, effective advocates direct their energies to those who have the authority to either finish the job or carry it to the next level. Effective advocates are knowledgeable. 
Passionate support can be part of the equation, but passion without knowledge carries little weight. As an in-house attorney at Motorola, I often participated in selecting what we referred to as outside counsel to represent the company in high-stakes matters. We were very focused on choosing attorneys who knew the law exceptionally well in the area of concern, whether intellectual property, environmental, or antitrust. In this way, we could be confident they had credibility with the decision maker. In addition, they would have the power to plead our case in the best possible light, advise us about the areas where our position was weak, and help us strengthen our position. Outside the legal field, I likewise repeatedly see the value of in-depth knowledge. For example, our daughter Mandy graduated from college with an emphasis in special education, long before she knew she would be the mother of two children with special needs. She has drawn on her formal education and supplemented that knowledge with informal learning in order to become a powerful advocate for her own children and for other children with special needs. I have marveled as I watch her advocate on their behalf for services and opportunities, and I have watched our grandchildren's potential blossom as a result. In persuading the person with power, substantive knowledge is important. However, I often observe situations where the point was not carried by the most intelligent attorney in the room, but by the attorney who had gained the trust of those who needed to be persuaded. This characteristic was highlighted by Scalia and Garner, who noted the human proclivity to be more receptive to an argument from a person who is both trusted and liked. Moreover, while a general reputation as trustworthy is valuable, to be an effective advocate, you must specifically earn the trust of those you are seeking to persuade. It, trust must be earned, and it is not easily given. In too many cases, I see individuals spend their energy insulting and criticizing from afar those who disagree with them, rather than working to earn their trust. How can you do this? One way to earn the trust of those you are seeking to persuade is to get to know them. In a 2010 editorial in the New York Times, Senator Evan Bayh reflected on the changes that had occurred in Washington, D.C. since the time when his father served as a senator from Indiana. He recounted, When I was a boy, members of Congress from both parties, along with their families, would routinely visit our home for dinner or the holidays. This type of social interaction hardly ever happens today, and we are the poorer for it. It is much harder to demonize someone when you know his family or have visited his home. Or, as the beloved but fictional attorney Atticus Finch put it, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. Dialogue is enhanced and understanding is increased when underlying relationships are strengthened. Another key way to earn trust is to be respectful. Rexley exemplified effective advocacy, and he analogized effective advocacy to having a conversation about an important topic with a friend, not just any friend, but one that is respected and looked up to. Showing respect is of critical importance when dealing with those having the ultimate authority to grant your request, but it can be of equal importance in dealing with those who have different points of view. A final key way to gain trust is to acknowledge the strengths of the opposing point of view. Good advocates do not try to defend the indefensible. When the other side has valid arguments, Garner and Scalia advise, boldly proclaim your acceptance of them, thereby demonstrating your fairness, your generosity, and your confidence in the strength of your case, and burnishing your image as an eminently reasonable advocate. Effective advocates can still ably represent their clients' strengths while conceding that the other point of view is not entirely devoid of merit, and their credibility is significantly enhanced as a result. I hope I have persuaded you to be an advocate and that you are realizing you have the ability to become a powerful advocate, especially if you come to law school. However, you may well be wondering for whom and what you should advocate. As much as it pains me to confess, I cannot answer this question for you. However, I can share two guiding principles. First, 
Never forget you are advocating for individual children of God. It is easy to become so caught up in the larger cause that we forget the individuals for whom we are advocating. Lanny Guineer is a well-known civil rights attorney who went on to become the first tenured professor at Harvard Law School who was a woman of color. In her memoirs, she observed with regret that as the civil rights movement unfolded, she and her fellow advocates became so caught up in developing legal doctrine and establishing legal precedent, they distanced themselves from the very people on whose behalf they brought the cases in the first place. Constant reminders are necessary to avoid this pitfall. Dallin Oaks has represented and led large institutions, and he keeps this picture, the forgotten man, in his office as a constant reminder of the importance of the individual. The fundamental reminder, of course, is the example of our Savior. His advocacy is provided on an individual basis. For example, the Savior tells the prophet Joseph and a small group of elders to lift up your hearts and be glad, for I am in your midst and I am your advocate with the Father. He tells Oliver Cowdery, Peter Whitmer Jr., and Zebra Peterson that he is their advocate with the Father. He is not an advocate in some abstract theoretical sense, but on a very personal, individualized basis. Second, be willing to accept the clients God sends your way, no matter how imperfect they may be. This I am sure about. They will come, inconveniently, surprisingly, interruptingly, but they will come. As the Savior stated in His great intercessory prayer, I pray for them which Thou hast given me. Let me illustrate how this has worked in my life. At one point in my career, I did volunteer work in the juvenile courts, serving as a court-appointed attorney, which means I represented anyone the court gave me to represent. Sometimes I found my clients easy to advocate for right from the start. Other times, not so much. I had committed to accept those court appointments, however, and in every case, I found it easier to advocate for my clients after I had truly gotten to know them and their stories. In like manner, God has given me a family composed of unique individuals. He has given me visiting teachees and young women. He has given me hundreds of applicants to BYU Law. Some of these clients have been easy to advocate for right from the start. Others, not so much. However, there has never been a case where I did not find it easier to advocate for these individuals after I had truly gotten to know them and their stories. God does not give us perfect clients, but thankfully our Savior does not advocate for us because we are perfect, but rather because He knoweth the weakness of man. As you seek to answer the specifics of who for yourself, start with those people God places in your life. God will also prepare you for what you should advocate. As Ava Weitzman recently pointed out in her devotional remarks, God knows you, and even though you may not yet know His plans, He knows the end from the beginning. He is preparing and qualifying you for the work He wants you to do. You may end up advocating on behalf of disabled children, or displaced families, or individuals whose civil rights have been violated, or elderly grandparents who need care. But when God sends a client your way, He will have provided you with the opportunity to prepare to advocate for what your client truly needs. And when we are unsure what to advocate for, we can again take instruction from the example of Jesus Christ. As our advocate, He pleads for, with the Father that we will be kept from evil, develop unity, and that we will know we are loved. We will never go wrong when we advocate for these results. To illustrate these principles, I would like to share two examples of advocacy from the scriptures. In the book of Numbers, we find the account of the five daughters of Zelophehad. Their father died, and they had no brothers. Under the existing inheritance laws, they would not receive any of their father's land because they were women. They did not sit around and complain to each other, nor did they simply whine about this injustice to their neighbors. Instead, they pled their case before Moses, someone in authority who had the power to grant their request. They were knowledgeable about the applicable laws, 
pointing out to Moses that their father had not violated any of the laws that would have required a forfeiture of the land, and noting that the effect of the current law would result in their father's name being done away from among his family. Acknowledging the concerns of others about preserving tribal lands, they agreed to marry within their own tribe. Moses was persuaded by their effective advocacy, and the result was a change in the inheritance laws benefiting not only themselves, but future generations of Jewish women who might otherwise have seen their families' lands go to more distant relatives. In the Book of Mormon, the missionary Ammon had become part of the household of King Lamoni and his unfortunately nameless wife, simply referred to as the Queen, who is the star advocate of this story. Upon being taught the wonders of the Savior's Atonement by Ammon, Lamoni falls to the earth as if he were dead. He continues in this state for two days and two nights, and a great deal of lamenting takes place. After this length of time, certain members of King Lamoni's constituency decide it is time to take his body and lay it in a sepulcher. Fortunately, the Queen recognizes it is time to advocate for her husband. She realizes Ammon has the power to help her husband, and she calls for him. She shows Ammon respect by acknowledging that he is a prophet and can do mighty works. She gains credibility by acknowledging the opposing point of view, but she also skillfully makes the best of her client's position when she states, Others say that he is dead and that he stinketh, and that he ought to be placed in the sepulcher. But as for myself, to me he doth not stink. Her advocacy is effective. Ammon responds to her request to examine Lamoni and promises that on the next day he will rise again. She did not have a perfect client. To some people, he literally stunk. But she was his advocate, and Lamoni was not buried alive. In closing, I want to share a poignant example of advocacy from my own life. I did not get married until I was 46 years old. I had reached the age where I thought that if I ever did get married, it would be a marriage of convenience, someone I was comfortable with, nothing more, nothing less. Some close friends, Lois Jean Spencer, who is here today, and Marcy Linio introduced me to one of their other close friends, who was a widower, Farrell Sorensen, who is a kind, faithful, wonderful man. They advocated for him with me and for me with him, and they were very effective advocates. We fell in love with each other, an all-encompassing love, nothing convenient about it. We got married, and as I continue to say, life became much better, but it did not become easier. Commuting coast to coast, I was working outside Philadelphia, he was working outside San Francisco, merging two households, realizing I was no longer the only one whose opinion mattered with respect to setting the thermostat, Figuring out my roles as wife, mother, and grandmother, etc., etc., was fun but demanding. His youngest son, Travis, was still living at home, but he was planning to move out a couple of months after we got married, so I set my expectations accordingly. I was fond of Travis, but going from living alone to living with a husband was enough of an adjustment, and I didn't really have the desire or energy to adjust to living with a 21-year-old male at the same time. Travis left in June as anticipated, and I wished him well, while feeling a little more like the home in California was now my home. Then in late August, Farrell let me know that because of some unfortunate circumstances, Travis was moving back in with us. I was not happy about this at all. So I called my parents, expecting their complete sympathy. I explained the situation to them and how inconvenient it was going to be for me how unfair this was when I was trying to adjust to married life, and how this would impinge on my precious time with Farrell. Clearly, this was all about me. The response I got from my parents was not sympathetic consolation. They became zealous advocates for Travis. They knew I had the power to make Travis's return positive or negative, so they advocated for the positive approach. They had gained my trust through years of interactions, so I was favorably inclined to hear what they had to say. They conceded there was some merit to my position—not much, but some— 
acknowledging this might not be the most convenient situation for me, but they focused on helping me see Travis in a different light. They pointed out how difficult this must be for him, how he probably wasn't any more excited about moving back in than I was, and how he was having to adjust to having a stepmother while still intensely missing his own mom. They helped me see how important it was that Travis feel loved. Because of their advocacy, I generally welcomed Travis back into our home. I'm sure I didn't always love him perfectly, but I was much more loving than I would have been without my parents' advocacy on his behalf. His living with us for the next year and a half became a great blessing in my life, and the love we share now is priceless to me. God will guide us as we develop our advocacy skills, and He will provide us with opportunities to be advocates for His children. He will place some of us in situations to advocate to the highest legal authority in the land for changes that will benefit His children for generations. He will place others of us in situations where we can persuasively declare on behalf of one of our brothers or sisters, to me he doth not stink. And I can virtually guarantee he will enable each of us to advocate for one another within our families. Whatever specific realm we may be advocating in, if we promote unity and invite others to love one another, we can be sure we are advocating in a way that is pleasing to Him. I testify of these principles in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, our Advocate with the Father. Amen. <laughs>